So let's talk about his record on drugs. Uh, it doesn't get any better. It's all downhill. Like we said the nice things about Biden at the beginning, like the reconciliation portion of our show has ended. We are going full libertarian screeching against this guy here now. Um, Biden in 1982, he's the one who coined the term drug, drug czar. He's the one that created the czar term that was so famous or infamous during Obama. In 1982, in a New York Times article, Biden coined the term drug czar when he called for the federal government to create the new role. But Senator Joseph R. Biden Jr., um, man, I forgot what the R stands for, but it's some like really like weird, funny middle name. Can when, Harry? Can you look up what his middle name is? Because it made me laugh. It made me giggle. But I'm I'm super. I've been up since five a.m. and it's nine p.m. and I'm goofy. With the orange theory? Hmm? Nah, I didn't make it today. I've just been working, working, working. Uh, so Biden, who is a strong advocate of anti-narcotics efforts, said today that he thought no program could work without a cabinet level drug czar in charge to coordinate the work of various agencies. In 89, Biden went on national television to criticize a plan from H.W. Bush to escalate the war on drugs because his plan didn't go far enough in escalating the war on drugs. Quite frankly, the president's plan is not tough enough, bold enough, or imaginative enough to meet the crisis at hand, Biden said. He called not for harsher punishments for drug dealers, but to hold every drug user accountable. Uh, Robinette, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. Uh, it's a family name. Uh, Bush's plan, he added, doesn't include enough police officers to catch violent thugs, he said, not enough prosecutors to convict them, not enough judges to sentence them, and not enough prison cells to put them away for a long time. Uh, there's that thug word again that he keeps using. Biden co-sponsored the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, which strengthened the prison sentences for drug possession, enhanced penalties for transporting drugs, and established the Office of National Drug Control Policy, which coordinates and leads federal anti-drug efforts. Charged with formulating and administrating America's drug prohibition game plan, the ONDCP almost immediately began agitating for a massive expansion of interdiction enforcement and incarceration efforts. So he, he got his new office and immediately started growing uh, and, and empowering that office to put more people of color in jail and uh, warehouse more poor people uh, without any hope of getting out of the cycle. Charged with formulating and administrating America's, oh, I read that, uh, quote, no attempt should be made to disguise the fact that significant new resources will be required to pay for many proposals advanced in this report. Last February, this administration requested nearly $717 million in new drug budget authority for the fiscal year 1990. Now, after six months of careful study, we have identified an immediate need for $1.4 billion more. With this report, the administration is requesting in 1990 the Drug Budget Authority totaling $7.8 billion. In 1996, when the uh, Nas Office of National Drug Control Policy came up for reauthorization, Biden voted in the Senate for the bill and added this direction for the department. The director shall ensure that no federal funds appropriated to the office shall be expended for any study or contract relating to the legalization for medical use or other use of a substance listed in the Schedule 1 of the Cons Controlled Substances Act. He means marijuana. And take such actions as necessary to oppose any attempt to legalize the use of such a substance in any form. There's different schedules of drugs. And Schedule 1 is the most hardcore. That's PCP and, and angel dust and cocaine and heroin and pot. Pot was put in there. He's, he's, and Joe Biden helped. He's the man. <laughs> he's the man. The office committed itself to keep certain substances illegal, even if new credible information came to light. In fact, as the last line suggests, the drugs are even encouraged to take whatever action is necessary to keep this information from the American public. So when we talk about the how the boomers screwed up America, this is what I'm talking about. All of Joe Biden's career, bad on foreign policy, bad on spending, bad on the war on drugs, bad on crime, bad on the centralization of government. These people don't know what they're talking about. And this person isn't qualified to be the president of the United States because he's a certified idiot. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. A 2006 report by the ACLU found that in 1986, before the enactment of federal mandatory minimum sentencing for crack cocaine offense, the average federal drug sentence for blacks was 11% higher than whites. Four years later, the average federal drug sentencing for blacks was 49% higher. So in 86, before the mandatory minimums, the average sentence was 11% higher. After the mandatory minimums, 49% higher. That is directly due to Joe Biden. In 2003, Biden sponsored the Reducing Americans' Vulnerability to Ecstasy Act, the RAVE Act, which altered existing legislation known as the Crack House Law. And basically, it made it legal for prosecutors to treat a nightclub like a crack house. And so they would they would go after the property and the businesses of any club owner or promoter if drugs were found on their property, which means civil asset forfeiture, and they could seize anything they found in there. The law basically turned clubs into crack houses. In the last few years in the Senate, Biden did not support the full elimination of the sentencing disparity between the crack and powder co- cocaine. Uh, that We're talking 2000s. Biden remains one of the very few prominent Democrats who still failed to endorse cannabis legalization at the federal level. And according to his recent stance on the subject, he decriminalized use, moved to expunge records for using, remove federal enforcement in states that have legalized it, and remove it from being a Schedule One narcotic. I can't imagine that's where his heart truly is, considering. So, you know, Reinhold, it, it, I've watched enough like Alpha House or West Wing or, you know, 90, like Dave. Uh, what did I just watch the other day that was uh, a political comedy about the 90s? You know, or my, my fellow Americans, rest in peace to Wilford Brimley. That's his greatest role was in our, My Fellow Americans. You know, I've watched enough of that to know the cynical thing in the 90s was, you know, grab onto an issue that's popular and ride that. Look like you're tough on it. You're the man on it. You know, and that's how he was with crime. Like, this is a popular high polling issue. I'm going to be the guy on it. I'm going to be the guy on, you know, on, uh, you know, being tough on crime. And that's going to help me get elected to the presidency in 88 or 2008. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that how this feels like you you give us any insight into why this guy was so wrong on crime and drugs? Well, I think it was. I think it's part of it is a conservative background that he has. He's not a, he's not a liberal, right? By any stretch of imagination, he's a Democrat. We started with the conversation where he was originally a Republican and he switched to Democrat because he probably felt he could get on the ballot easier that way. He's a Catholic. Um, too. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's a conservative. He's he's the older generation, the boomers, they're uh, very conservative people at the, this is, they grew up in the, in the fifties times when things were great. And why isn't everybody wanting to go back to the fifties without realizing there's a whole segment of the population that did not have the greatest time in the fifties as they did. So he, he's taking a long time to get through there. And I also think some of it's very cynical. So we talked about how, um, his persona of him being just a working class guy and, and, and all that was sincere came, came from a place of sincerity. But I think a lot of the times the sp- decisions he stands for or pushes for are what gives him the most uh, camera time, political capital. You know? Right. So he's, he's a lot more cynical. So he's, he's able at this point to try to go, okay, now I changed my mind on all that stuff. And that's what he's going to be trying to do. But you saw with the civil asset forfeiture where it started out as just the mob guys. And then he wrote, you know, and he wrote that stuff. And then he wrote the civil civil asset forfeiture for uh, let's do it for drug offenses. Right. I mean, that was the progression up into the two, you know, 2001, where it became, oh, let's get the terrorists, too. Um, so that you know that's where that all comes from but i think it's I, I still think a lot of it is more just rooted in his conservatism as a conservative democrat than it is um trying to see where the winds of the of the people go as much what is he conserving the idea that to be a reformed criminal you must meet middle class white standards yeah for the most part i mean that's if you think about what conservatism is it's conservative it's conserving the old ways the old institutions the law and order 
right? So in order to fight law and order, you have to be tough on crime. People don't understand that they don't like the new age hippie. We have to understand where they come from and why are people violent and why are people uh, breaking the law? And they don't want to understand that. They just want to punish it because if they figure if they punish it hard enough, if they dominate, if they smack down, people will finally say, okay, I'll, I'll not do that. You know, it'll finally be enough of a deterrent to them to, to not do that. But we've seen with the death penalty, the death penalty doesn't work as a deterrent. It never really has. So how can you be harder than that on anybody? So uh, I, I don't know how you can keep that mindset personally of these are, are about deterrence as opposed to trying to fix what's broken in this person and make them more of a, a capable human being in society. Um, but that's that was the mindset of the 50s, of the 60s, of, uh, you know, law and order. You know, you you just did what was right. You did you punish the people who did wrong. And he's the perfect example of like yeah. culture is downstream from politics because yeah. people wanted this because the population begged for it. Joe yeah. Biden gave it to them. And if they hadn't wanted that certain thing, he would have given them something different. Exactly. And and, and that's the thing, too, is that America at the time was very conservative in that thinking, in that uh, thought process of how to deal with criminals, you know. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, it's, it's the, it's the punishment of smacking the, smacking the kid on the butt or trying to figure out why they're acting out. Right. Right. No, I think that's a good point. You know, it's, it's domination versus empathy. Uh, Brian says Biden has always had presidential aspirations and going back to the eighties and running a tough on crime Democrat would make him more palatable to the population as a whole during the Reagan Bush time frame. except it's always all BS. Biden has always tried to ride the middle line of politics of middle America. You know, he the only people that helped in his 72 Senate campaign were the AFL CIO. And he always had a close relationship with the unions and always tried to go after that lane, which is why when we're talking, we're looking at the 2020 field of Democrats. We go, this guy is the one that appeals to the broadest range of Americans because he has strategically positioned himself like a chameleon to be that way. I th do think there is some, you know, here's a guy who wants to ride the train. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not heartless. I'm sure there is part of that that is real, but I'm not also naive in thinking that there wasn't strategy to some of that stuff, too, and trying to position yourself for a certain, you know, as a media brand, we try to position ourselves for, you know, a certain strain like we're, we're positioning ourselves for new libertarians right we're positioning ourselves we try not to to be inflammatory too much uh towards the left or right or or new democrats well yeah you know Dan is a reinhold but what can you do um you know everybody who is in public life of which we are in public life uh, politicians are in public life if you're talking to large groups of people you do think about your image. You do think about how you are positioned. You do think about how people perceive what you do, knowing you can't totally control it, but you can to a certain extent. You know, it's 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 hard to fool people. You know, it's hard to I have I have worked around politicians, race car drivers, comedians, celebrities, my my entire 20 year career at people that are in public life. I've never seen anybody in private. There's been one person out of all the people. If you look at a celebrity or you look at a public figure and you think they're a jerk, they're a jerk. I can tell you for a fact, Danica is a jerk or was a jerk when I was around her. She, she may be totally different and grown up now, but she was not nice back in the mid 2000s. <laughs> but everybody kind of knew that you could tell that, right? There's only one person I've ever seen fool everybody who was that had an image of gold, a nice person, total ass bag behind the scenes. Uh, it was a race car driver and a fairly successful race car driver um, of Brazilian descent. That's how, all I will say. But uh, you, you will have to do the rest of the work. But, you know, every politician that you thought was a jerk that I met behind the scenes, total jerk. Gabriel Iglesias, Jeff Foxworthy, Larry the Cable Guy, Jim Gaffigan – nicest people I've ever met. I've never met anybody nicer than Fluffy, you know? And, and like, 
you can tell that if you watch them. So I, I think there's there's some aspect to it where you go, yeah, Biden is probably playing up his strengths and the the decreasing his weaknesses, but he probably is kind of that blue collar regular guy. But the issues that he chose to emphasize, I definitely think are telling of his character and uh, his character is, I want to be president. I will tell you whatever you want to hear to make that happen. You know, so here we are. Um, and, and part of the problem is going to be that the Democratic Party is has and always kind of always has, but is still currently fighting for control of the party, who's going to lead the party. And it's, is it going to be the moderate Democrats, the blue dog Democrats who are more conservative, or is it going to be the, the left your wing type of uh, Bernie bros. Right. right. And you, you talk about that. So, so you've got black lives matter, who obviously is not going to be a big fan of Joe Biden, but then you look at the Bernie bros and who authored the uh, bill who made student loan debt, non-dischargeable through bankruptcy that was joe biden mm. so what's the big one of the biggest things that the bernie bros are trying to get pushed through is that's forgiveness of all the 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 uh student loan debt well the reason that there is student loan debt like that one of the biggest reasons is because uh that bill was authored and right. now you know you have all these schools knowing that not only um, are they getting backed by the government, but they also know that they can't be discharged by, you know, they, they don't have to worry about it being discharged by bankruptcy. So they know that that debt's good forever, that they can bank on it. Right. right. So, so you're telling uh, me Joe Biden is why my college tuition is so expensive. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. This guy, man, what a, okay. Uh, the man. yeah. White people get student loans. Black people get prison time. Yeah. It's equal. Basically, white America from uh, from the boomer perspective. Um, well, think about it too. You talked about the uh, sentencing drug lines being changed from between crack and co um, and regular powder cocaine mm -hmm. in 2010, but it was only changed so it's not as disparate as it was. Mm. It's still pretty disparate, right? You know, so it went from what 18, you know, from 10 yeah. to 18, and then we still have like a. 300 or something like that because the, uh, the communities have been cannibalized by this for 30 years mm -hmm. like the, the crack, the crack, the crack thing was all you know people understand where the crack thing even comes from it wasn't because you know black people preferred crack it was just it was you know it was easier to sell at the time to, to right. those people right so i mean you know the gangs were trying to trying to infiltrate and make the money because that's what that's what happens in a in a prohibition you have the gangs starting running things running the the illegal drug trades right just like we did in the in 1920s i mean it was it's people can't look back at history and see the the repeat of everything that they've done and they continue to just keep doing it and we're doing it with this we're, we're we've still got like like i said all the stuff that you were hearing biden say in the 70s and 80s Trump is saying the same thing to get himself elected. Yeah. You know, and he's doing the same thing. So it's not he's like appealing to the anybody's people. learned Biden anything. Trying, yeah. Biden is trying to appeal to a different base. By, uh, Trump is trying to appeal to the base that Joe Biden tried to appeal to in mm -hmm. 30 years ago. But that's what we know about Donald Trump. Donald Trump descended the Golden Tree House in 1983 and has never stretched his worldview beyond 1983. And he still thinks like your dad's golfing buddy. And, you know, that's just his reality. He doesn't he doesn't want to he doesn't want to deal with the other. He just wants to deal with what he thinks is like his version of American exceptionalism is, you know, the wealthiest, the most stuff, you know, the whitest, prettiest face, <laughs> maybe of European Eastern European descent. Uh, he'll negotiate on that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, and the most guns, the most the biggest military like that's his version of American exceptionalism, not the traditional view of American exceptionalism, which is natural rights tradition, uh, you know, a federal system with local localities having the most power, unity through diversity. Uh, I mean, you know, he Joe Biden isn't that far off from that same notion when you really look at his record. All right. and, and you can remember I where I live at right now is very. Um, it's the people he's speaking to is where I grew is where I, so I go to the local market this weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a small town, you know, 
thousand people live there maybe at the most. And um, there's a guy in there without a mask on going, I can't believe, you know, people are making us wear these things. And it's just, you hear this all the time when you, when you kind of spend a lot of time in, in rural America is that there's a mindset and it is strong and it is there and it's not going away anytime soon, but it's also rooted in really no experience dealing with a lot of different types of people. It's, it's kind of growing up with the same mindset all around you and that just prolonging and, and living longer. Like I was growing up in the seventies, but I was living in the country. So or like in the eighties. So I, I, I had all the seventies stuff in the eighties, right? We right. Were yeah. Like we did in the seventies, but it, my, my wife, she lived in the city at the time and there's pictures of her. She's four years younger than me. And there's pictures of her with the big hair and all the stuff. And we were still, you know, the girls were still wearing the seventies haircuts and stuff back then. So it was like 10 years behind the rest of the, uh, of the metropolis areas or the more urbane areas, because there's just more variety there for, for society to kind of grow and, and evolve living out in, in rural America, you don't get that. So you stay in that, you know, the, the, um, the Walton's type of mindset of what America is supposed to be. And then right. I think that's the that's the kind of thing that uh, people like Trump and, and Biden have both kind of played to the whole careers because they were the ones who made sure they went and voted and they were the majority for a long period of time. I think it's switching. I mean, it's changing up. I think with the Internet, that ability to isolate goes away a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see a, a lessening of that. But that's kind of the how the duopoly of America has happened, where we have, you know, people in, in the cities who are more exposed to things like that being a lot more liberal as it were and then the rural being a lot more conservative um that's going to start to fade away i think with as we go forward with uh, more integration in in the internet i yeah. like this i mean i like to think that i don't know if it's going to actually happen or not but no i think the the internet's weird because it increases diversity but also encourages homogenation and so yeah, you you sure. lose the regional dialect, you lose the regional news, you lose the the like we are focused solely on the presidential race because we don't have access to reliable information about local races. You know, yeah. you'd be more interested in the local races, I guarantee it, if you had a way to pay attention to it. But the media encourages the incentive structure for we are libertarians is to broadcast to the nation, nay the world, as opposed to Indianapolis. You know, right. Uh, right. so it, that's why we choose to do it that way. You know, if you want to grow something big with a national focus, you know, that that's that, that's more attractive for ego and monetization reasons and just interest because it's easier to get information. Right. I can go look at think tanks all day long, but there's no real think tanks about Indiana politics. Right. Like, so if you're intellectually curious, it's just kind of, you know, well, there's boss hog. There is Boss Hog, thank goodness, and Boss Hog, Mother Mother Hog, right then. The Waltons were progressive, though. So well, right. the Republicans were progressives back in this, back in the uh, turn of the century. Yeah, you know, all the all the ones who wanted to keep out all the immigrants, they were all progressives. Yep. 